Okay, I'm looking at the time and it's just half past now, so I think we can get started. Um, so hi to everyone watching online and live. Um, welcome back to the second day of the conference. I'm just going to quickly, before we get started, give just some brief overview for the people joining um, today or people who haven't joined yesterday. We'll be um, streaming live on YouTube, so you can watch the stream from... Um, the website, but if you want to engage and ask any questions um, for the speakers, feel free to click ahead um, on the YouTube link where you will be able to ask any questions and provide any comments because we are sort of streaming from Zoom right now. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy to be here uh, with you all today. My name is Ama Ionescu and I'll be um, moderating or hosting the discussion today. And without further ado, I'll get quickly started with the introductions of our speakers today. Um, so we have Dr. Sumit Jain um, joining us, uh, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Social Work at the University of Edinburgh. He is trained in cultural psychiatry and his research and teaching center around community mental health, ethnographic methods, South Asia, and global mental health movements. He has led a number of studies characterizing psychotherapy and knowledge production and transfer in India and Northern India in particular. So thank you for joining us. And then next we have um, Professor Steve Holland, who is a clinical psych psychologist at Vanderbilt University, where his work lies in the etiology and treatment of depression in adults. Steve's research extends from basic psychopath Gee, sorry, I'm <laughs> butchering my words, um, to prevention and treatment. He is especially interested in the relative contribution of cognitive and biological processes to depression, as well as how psychosocial and pharmacological interventions might compare with one another. Recently, Steve has grown more interested in the prevention of depression, evolutionary approaches to depression, and the treatment of depression in low resource settings. Um, Steve currently aids with work at Sangha, which, which is a non-profit based in Goa, India, that trains lay counselors to administer therapy within their communities. Um, and then last but not least, uh, we have Agastya Javeri here. He's a high school senior who prefers to introduce himself as a student researcher, as this usually gets a bit more attention when discussing topics that typically are reserved for uh, quote-unquote doctors. He was first introduced to critical psychiatry after being, being received after receiving ineffective treatment in diagnostic centric biomedical systems. He conducts he conducts action research and writes a blog on these topics called the Manus Project. Um, so thank you everyone for being here, and uh, I look forward for the next hour long discussion around global mental health. And I thought a good question to start us off with is sort of. Um, if everyone could answer what they understand by um, global mental health, because there is no sort of singular definition. And I think when people talk about global mental health, we always come at it from different understandings and points of view. So I think it will be good for both the audience who might not be so familiar with it, um, but also to situate everyone. And so I wanted to ask you, what does global health mean to you? And Particularly, I also wanted to ask to what extent you feel comfortable to share um, sort of how you situate that definition that you have in the context of your training and your background and your sort of traje trajectory and experiences. So um, thinking a bit about positionality in global mental health, I suppose. Um, so um, I don't know, Sumit, do you want to start us off with? Sure. Um, thank you. Um, am I audible all right? Yeah. Um, so just please cut me off if I talk too much. I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, yeah, so I, I, that was a really interesting question about because of this whole thing of what is global mental health. I think the way that you've positioned the question around um, thinking about positionality really got me thinking as well a little bit because I, I think when this, when I, when sort of the idea of this, this is the global mental health movement and the Lancet, Lancet, the first Lancet series started. I was still a, I was a PhD student at the time, and I didn't. My PhD work engaged with it a little bit, but not not in not um, directly. But when I moved to Edinburgh, 
I, uh, in about 11 years ago, I didn't really think of myself as a global mental health um, scholar or researcher. Um, but then some of us, uh, some, several of us started looking at sort of the, the, the sort of the chasms within debates in global mental health about 10 or 11, 12 years ago. Um, and the fact that there were people sort of who were at the forefront of the movement and there were others who were critics. And I think we felt several of us who had been doing ethnographic research in the 2010s, um, uh, sorry, before 2010, but not sort of 2007 to 10 period, um, felt that actually there had to be a middle position around this where we can look at this, look at this both critically, but yet still be part of the praxis around global mental health. And I think that's sort of partly where I had, I had sort of positioned myself um, within the field. Um, and, and I guess in terms of my training coming from an um, international development undergraduate degree and then social work training um, and then training in medical anthropology and cross-cultural psychiatry, I, I think I would I would see global mental health partly within a cultural psychiatry or transcultural psychiatry frame. And that's sort of where I, I would also position myself and within and linked within linked into medical um anthropological um frames of thinking. Um that said, I I now now I'm in a position of running a master's program in global mental health and society that crosses social work, anthropology, and psychology. And I think I now see it much more from an interdisciplinary frame. And I think that's that's for me is where I, I think I think the field is hopefully heading where there's much more there's emphasis on the critical, on the social, but also on the rights-based approaches and how those can frame uh, what we do. And and I think increasingly that I think the rights-based framework is something that can help to encompass many aspects and hopefully bring people together into a into a into a dialogue rather than being um uh, rather than sort of early what was happening a lot earlier where people were very much at loggerheads. So I think I'll I'll stop there. But that's sort of where I I haven't really answered your question of how you define global mental health. But I think the problem is it's not how we define it. I think your question sort of suggests it depends on where we're coming at it from. But what I'm suggesting is perhaps rice bright space frameworks are ways in which we might begin to sort of further refine some of those definitions. Great. Thank you so so much. Maybe Stephen, do you want to go next? Was that Steve? Yes. Yeah, to got you. Sure. Uh, again, I'm, I'm trying to keep the sound down just a bit. And can you guys hear me okay? Gotcha. Good. Uh, I, I'm new to global mental health, so I don't know. Uh, I'm just not familiar with the debates, the issues that go on within. It's been really in the last 10, at most 15 years that I've been uh, moving in that direction. And I've had some marvelous uh, guides in doing that. Uh, two things have been happening for me over the last uh, uh, last decade or so. Uh, one was falling in with some really marvelous global mental health researchers, Vikram Patel out of India, uh, who has a, a, a non-governmental organization, Sangath, which has done uh, what I think is some remarkable work uh, uh, in the Indian subcontinent and other places as well. Uh, he has a protege, Daisy Singla, who's been uh, uh, now in, is in Toronto, but also has uh, been a real guide for me. And then at the same time, I've been talking with uh, an evolutionary biologist, a fellow by the name of Paul Andrews, and uh, who uh, would take the position that, uh, that at least the non-psychotic disorders aren't disorders at all. They're evolved adaptations that uh, uh, served a purpose in our ancestral past, and that some of the things we do to treat them might almost be akin to anesthetizing and uh, in a way that interferes with the working through of, of, the, of what uh, triggered the distress. So so those two things are coming at about this about the same time. Um, I know a bit about depression. I know a bit, a bit about its treatment, but uh, moving into other contexts, other cultures where people don't even use the term, I don't think there's a word for depression in Hindi, where we do most of our recent research, uh, people do have uh, stress. They do have things going on in their lives, and they will find themselves having difficulty sleeping, uh, 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 oftentimes was that all, all the characteristics that you might find a depression show up, but they wouldn't think of it in those terms. And some of the things that you might expect, I might expect to find uh, just aren't there. So I'd say a uh, summary for me is it's been an eye-opening experience to find that uh, people are more similar around the world in some respects, but the cultural aspects really make for some real differences. And um, I've been blessed to have uh, good guides as we move into that process. Great, thank you so much. I guess, did you want to go next? Sure, sure. Um, okay, so yeah, my understanding of global mental health uh, more lies on, I think, as a discipline uh, that kind of designs and implements 
and investigates various psychosocial interventions, uh, especially how they play out in low resource settings. Um, I think Dr. Uh, Vikram's uh, work has been instrumental to my understanding as well, and some of Sangat's work. Um, and uh, another thing is also, I think I look at uh, mental health more from a rights-based approach as what uh, Sumit said uh, on how uh, you can elevate suffering and prevent harm, but also uh, close the treatment gap uh, across the globe. Yeah. Great, thank you. I think that was really useful to sort of situate ourselves and see a bit where sort of the perspectives or approaches that everyone is coming at this at. And I think to segue into that is perhaps quite a broad question, but I think it's not being asked enough in global mental health. And I think it's, why is it necessary? And why, what does global mental health specifically as a sort of subfield that has sort of emerged over the last 10 years or so, I would say, like Sumit said, with um, the Lancet Commission on it and really has situated itself as a area of research and attention. Why is it necessary and what does it bring to us and what was sort of lacking in scholarship or academic research and that sort of drove that push to it sort of coming up as a separate sort of sub-branch. Um, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that specifically. Can I come in here? Yes. Yeah, I was, I, I mean, I, I yeah, it's, it's an interesting question because it's partly about sort of where we as, uh, you know, both as scholars and practitioners um, might see a way of bringing resources and ideas into into a direction for a particular aim and I, and I, I think um one of the aims I mean I, I stated aims of those who sort of were at, you know, there in terms of sort of getting things going with the global health movement or the movement of global mental health was partly about following on how on how other disease related coalitions um organize themselves like the HIV AIDS um, research community and, and practice community and, and try to sort of use global mental health as a way obviously driven from the global burden of disease figures that came out in the in the, in the 2000s um to try and push for resources and and for action um i guess the other thing is that at a certain point in time you become invested also and speaking myself as as a as a scholar you become invested in a certain area and that allow that leads you to sort of almost promoted. So as I said, when I first joined here 11 years ago, I didn't think of myself as a global medical scholar. Um, but now I'm fully in it. And I'm, I'm and, 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 and so there's also a personal investment in terms of why the question about why things happen uh, and why it's necessary. Sometimes it's necessary because our interests um, make it necessary because we become invested in it. And I, and, and, and the, I guess the third point I, I wanted to say was that I think it's necessary to link back to Augustia's point about inequalities. And I think there's something there about addressing those inequalities. And that's probably for me why in a, at a at a higher level why it's necessary. Uh and why and why it's necessary because it ho hopefully will bring different disciplines to bear on looking at these inequalities rather than seeing this purely from a single or or, or single disciplinary perspective. It actually allows different disciplines to come to bear on what what are actually sort of serious challenges that need diverse ways of thinking and also need um, lived experience of people with mental health problems as well and all of these things on the table together so I hope my sense of why it's necessary is really because it provides a table hopefully which we can all sit at and and of course there are challenges in that in terms of power but that's that's sort of for me what where it sits Stephen I see yeah Augusta do you want to go or do you want me to go next you can go, you can go. All right, thank you, sir. The, uh, uh, what I've, a um, couple of things. Uh, as I've been in the process of uh, uh, joining in with uh, Vikram and, and Daisy and some of the work that they and their colleagues, uh, some marvelous folks at uh, Sangath have been doing, one thing struck me, the last trial that Vikram uh, Patel oversaw uh, was taking a behavioral activation intervention that's been developed uh, in, in the States and adapting it to uh, to India, the number of things that they need to do to make it culturally uh, uh, suitable. But they were using um, 
uh, lay counselors, people with no particular psychological psychiatric training, because they just didn't have uh, people with psychiatric psychological training in uh, in rural India where they were working. And um, it turns out that you could uh, make the intervention shorter. You could uh, 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 get down to the essence of those things. And the particular trial that they did was comparing this uh, 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 culturally adapted behavioral activation. They called it the Healthy Activities Project, HAP, uh, provided by lay counselors, mostly uh, uh, high school graduates that were determined they were going to change their culture. And I wouldn't bet against them in doing that. And they were doing it in rural uh, uh, primary care settings. And what uh, they did was to identify, they'd screen everybody coming into the setting. They'd identify people that uh, would meet criterion uh, for having a, a depressive disorder, uh, even though the term depression isn't used there, uh, but you could talk about stress. Uh, they'd let the uh, primary care physicians know that uh, this is an individual that scored higher on this uh, on these kinds of instruments. And uh, they'd also give them some world uh, advice about world health guidance, about how they could be treated pharmacologically if they do chose to do the treatment. And they compared their uh, psychological, short-term uh, psychological intervention developed by uh, like counselors, six to eight, uh, provided by late counselors, six to eight sessions with what they called enhanced usual care, which was letting the primary care physician know that the individual had something that sure looked like a depression and how it might be treated. Less than 5% of the folks uh, in the enhanced usual care condition got any kind of treatment for depression at all. They got good care for their uh, medical conditions, which is what the primary care physicians were uh, there and, and able to do, but it, it just wasn't happening. Um, so that uh, in a uh, in a good sized population uh, in 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 a good uh, uh, relatively uh, uh, reasonable well off state in India and in Goa, it just you you weren't getting any kind of treatment for something that was eminently treatable. Now, whether or not it's a good thing to treat or, or not, it's another process. We'll, uh, question we'll get into later on today, but it just was not occurring. Uh, now that's not unique to India. Vikram has now taken uh, uh, what he learned from the HAP project. He's trying to implement it in West Texas. And if you guys know anything about the states, um, it, 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 there's always a rural urban divide. I think one of the things I'm learning is it's less a matter of uh, where in the world things are, but is it an urban versus a rural area? And my goodness, some of the medical facilities I've seen, for example, in Bhopal, the All India Institute of Medicine is, is world class. It's as good as any uh, medical facility I've seen uh, in Chicago or, or Nashville. Uh, but when you get out into the countryside, things just change. And uh, the notion of getting something that could be deliverable, that uh, that is brief, uh, that doesn't rely on on professional uh, uh, delivery, I think is a is a boon for folks. And in that particular trial, they got a nice effect. People people are more likely to get better over their depressions sooner, uh, and then to hold that without uh, relapse over the subsequent year. And uh, uh, it, was, it was just a good outcome from something that was uh, deliverable and uh, and uh, fit the fit the setting. Yes, thank you for that. And I think also within what you were saying, what really also struck a chord with me was sort of when we're talking about geography and global mental health, I think really the idea that to me, at least in my work, is really important is that local is global, right? And I think we run into very unhelpful patterns when we're trying to sort of conceptualize global mental health as being sort of only in low and middle income countries. So I'm I'm really glad you raised that point and sort of rethinking by why we, what we understand yep. as global and understanding that the local too is global. Yep. So thank you for that point. And I guess, do you want to go next? Uh, I mean, I'm just going to add to Steve's point. Yeah, I think um, so some of this task shifting programs that have been happening here in India are, uh, seem to be really effective in terms of, you know, capacity building, especially because over here when this... Um, it is a severe shortage of, I think, psychiatrists and trained mental health professionals. And it's merely probably not, it's, it's impossible to train uh, psychiatrists um, and so many to serve all of them. So I think that's where class shifting comes in and global mental health plays a big role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I think that what you're saying brings us also really nicely into sort of a discussion that around the question that I wanted to ask next, next is about sort of what the value is and sort of importing um, sort of understandings or therapies or drugs into low income settings. Um, I, I think it's been interesting to see how it's sort of on one hand been a bit embraced and sort of reclaimed by sort of 
lay counselors and uh, healthcare workers, but like, I wonder if you have any opinions around the dynamics of that and um, yeah, I'm gonna keep it quite broad so that you can, I don't wanna be too prescriptive with what I give out. It's just a brief prompt, but if you have any thoughts around that, um, whoever wants to go first. So Matt, do you want to go or do you want me to? You, you go ahead, uh, uh, Stephen. Yep. Well, yeah. uh, let me just say that uh, in the United States, uh, no country with the possible exception of New Zealand uh, relies more on psychiatric medications than we do. Uh, I think uh, uh, about 12% of the population are taking uh, antidepressant medications, uh, mostly prescribed by primary care physicians. And I mean, that's that's grand to an extent. Uh, it's just that primary care physicians have a whole lot of things they have to worry about and depression, anxiety are well down the list there. Uh, with the advent of the uh, uh, SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, they were comfortable prescribing antidepressants. And when they were, they would start. If I go to see my primary care physician, I'll see her maybe once a year. Uh, if I happen to mention depression or anxiety, the one thing she knows how to do is to prescribe an antidepressant medication. It's easy. They're considered relatively safe. And that's led, led to a real uh, boom uh, kind of process here. Whether or not that's good for the individual, whether or not that's good for the society is a whole nother question. They do suppress symptoms, but they might have long-term atrogenic effects in the sense of prolonging the, the underlying episode. Uh, one of the things I've learned from my evolutionary uh, biology uh, uh, colleagues is that anything which uh, anything which gets in the way of a function that an adaptation evolved to serve is probably not going to be useful in the long run. Uh, we think of symptoms as things you want to suppress. If I get a cold, I can take over-the-counter cold remedies. They will suppress the symptoms, but the symptoms are the body's way of fighting off the infection, and my cold is going to last longer. So I'll be more comfortable during the process, but it'll, it'll, uh, it'll be prolonged. And we don't know for sure, but the reasons to think the same thing might happen with depression. Given that there are a number of different psychosocial interventions which work quite reasonably, which can be developed, can be uh, provided by lay counselors. You don't need uh, psychiatric, psychological uh, uh, training to do these kinds of things. It's not clear to me that it wouldn't be advantageous to make those available to folks. Uh, they work at least as well. They tend to have longer term lasting effects. And if there's any kind of long term atrogenic effect, I use that term uh, uh, cautiously because I don't think I don't think it makes the initial uh, symptoms worse. I think what it does is if it does anything, it prolongs the line episode. Uh, we may be in the process of uh, of exporting uh, a large pharmacological uh, approach to the rest of the world that might not necessarily need it, and we'd be better off backing off some of that from that in the States. Sumit, I see you unmuted yourself. Do you want to? Yeah, I was just, Augusta, do you want to go speak? No, I mean, you can speak. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I Yeah, I guess I was thinking about this, my, my, well, my perspective, drawing from sort of an ethnographic frame, has been looking at how local community workers what they're doing and how that might differ from the manual so to speak um, in terms of psychosocial interventions and I, so i mean um liana chase's work um an anthropologist at durham is excellent in this regard she's sort of in nepal she works in the has done i think work in nepal and looked at processes of task shifting and task sharing and it's very interesting when you read her work uh about how the sort of the the local social dynamics of how these things play out and how they play out in relation also to um to lo local idioms of distress and ways of conceptualizing um mental health in, in local local um local categories um some of the work we, we've been doing um in india um with colleagues has been one of the papers we're currently sort of um, working on is 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 been projects been looking at how local ngos innovate in delivering care and we uh, in, in terms of delivering psychosocial care um, and I think what's interesting for me, alongside the the fact that some things spread from country to country, is also the way in which um, local praxis is adapted and local practitioners adapt things, um, and sometimes adapt them in ways that ne aren't necessarily visible, uh, but actually are important adaptations in delivering um, care that's locally appropriate. And a lot of this isn't captured in in RCTs, um, it's not necessarily captured in ethnographies either. Um, that's what we were trying to look at, partly with our, our our work on 
innovation across three different NGOs in the Indian context was looking at sort of what what makes this different. And um, a second piece of work has been with Karen Mathias and other colleagues has been looking at in 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 Uttarakhand state in India, North India, how what it is that community health workers at a at an NGO project do in their day to day work, and what is what are the strategies and approaches they use to engage people and to improve mental health outcomes. So this is sort of part partly looking at it from the other end of thinking about well, what is taking place and how is that how does that relate to sort of um, both the manual they're working through and and what are they doing that's different that might actually be be more be more effective than that so that that's sort of the frame i i, I would see that in in terms of the fact and, and and other people have done similar work you know um stefan x my colleague here at edinburgh has done work in in, part, in western in eastern india um looking at um arguing that actually the treatment gap is a problematic concept and and arguing that actually the that that antidepressants are being distributed by, by pharmacies. So we, we know that in South Asia um, by um, by sort of um, um, unlicensed medical practitioners, and they're, they're distributed in various ways. So does the treatment gap exist? At what extent is there a treatment gap? Or is it, um, as some, some have suggested, I think, I think it was Smith or Patari, such as idea of a care gap instead, and that may be a more impro- appropriate frame. So yeah, I think there's, there's different ways we can unpack um, that question. Yes, I like that a lot. And I'm I'm a big fan about the literature on sort of critically approaching the treatment gap, because I think it leads to the erasure of a lot of voices and perspectives, right? Because you're necessarily assuming or validating specific forms of care and other forms of care that might take place that are a bit more sort of unseen or informal or um, in nature sort of get erased through the notion of the treatment gap right so I, I I think that's like a really interesting aspect of it and then thinking through why treatment gaps are so large maybe not in terms of the the sort of provision and quantity of provision right but like rather as a demand side problem of people not accessing them for a reason right yeah um, yeah. So yeah, I think that's where the rights-based frameworks might help us. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, so what are your thoughts on this? I mean, I'm just thinking that, you know, um, if we start, um, 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 uh, you know, I'm also thinking, I mean, I actually, actually, I have no thoughts right now at the moment. Yeah. That's no problem. Um, I'm just currently looking at the chat and um, Jess put a question in which I think uh, uh, we could jump into it now because it sort of fits within the discussion. And she said, uh, wondering if folks have any thoughts about epistemic injustice or lack of access to other ways of knowing slash understanding outside of the frame of mental health. And they continue by saying, I understand the urgency of addressing inequalities in care slash mental health outcomes, but I also noticed that perhaps the biomedical model eclipses eclipses reclaiming madness or a notion of mad pride. Um, And to finish off, they're saying, my home slash native country is in Southeast Asia, but I've been educated in the US and UK. Received my diagnosis slash began being in the mental health system when I was back home. Um, so I guess the core of the question here sort of pertains around epistemic injustice um, and lack of access, but I think also what they're getting at, which is really useful, is like when we're thinking about mental health, we sort of think of it, I guess, in a siloed way and just come at it from the mental health system, whereas like I think there's other sectors and that we can look at mental health from and sort of take a multi-sectoral approach. Um, but yeah, I w- I'm wondering about your thoughts on this, partic- particularly epistemic injustice. And um, whoever wants to speak, I'm, I don't necessarily need to take in a specific order. So if you feel inclined to speak, you can just unmute yourself. I, uh, yeah. Uh, I do feel there are like uh, many intersectionalities between mental health uh, and many other factors. And I think 
uh, some of the most effective interventions are the ones which address these other different intersectionalities as well, such as poverty and mental health, or um, um, I can take, for example, another disease and mental health. Um, so yeah, I think uh, going forward, I mean, we even are uh, trying to talk about global mental health. We should look at these interventions and how they can address many different um, factors as well and how they play a role in mental health. Yeah, and I, I think this links back to your one of the earlier questions as well about what is global mental health. And I, I think I often you know, think, well, if we drop the mental health, I mean, I mean, if we think about mental health as being something that's very much linked into wider inequalities, linked into social development, does using the term mental health actually narrow us and restrict us in terms of what we can do? But to come to Jess's question, um, I was also just thinking about the um, some of the yeah. So, so the the this question about who's a service user when there are no services, or when there's a lack of service, or when or when those services that are available, say the formal mental health services, don't fit into the your frame of thinking of a say a, a person in rural Uttar Pradesh um, who may not who may might access biomedical services, but may also access other forms of care and may have multiple ways of conceptualizing um, what's happening to them or to a family member. And, and so the, this raises a question, I think it's in terms of also the point, the, the wider point about sort of how you engage with um, with people with lived experience and what is the nature of lived experience? Is it about, is it for a, a, a woman living in a rural area in Northern in Uttar Pradesh, what, what is lived experience is is and maybe having a what we would see as a mental health problem is her lived experience about the mental health problem or is it about gender inequalities or is it about um social other social relationships or is it about poverty so it, it i think this question also opens up us to think about well, what what are the frames of thinking in terms of this point about reclaiming um this idea of madness is a notion of mad pride. I think it also opens up what is lived experience and what are, how do we frame that in, in different sorts of contexts when there may be way, different ways of knowing and different ways of understanding um, what we might call mental health difficulties. Yeah, yeah, and this is Steve. The uh, Certainly a couple of things really stand out for me as you guys discuss this. Uh, number one is that quotes technologies move all around the world from different directions. Yeah. Uh, there's, Few things are more popular in the states of the UK than mindfulness, which, of course, is meditation, which came out of uh, uh, three thousand years of Buddhist tradition. There, there are interesting things to learn that we can all benefit from. But various people can benefit from, and the the notion that technologies only go one direction is is just uh, kind of odd. The um, the other thing, Tip O'Neill, former Speaker of the House in the United States, used to say, all politics are local. And all uh, people live in a culture, they live in families, they live in circumstances where they're going to experience things in very different ways. And uh, uh, it's it, it's useful, it's important to get a sense as to what is uh, uh, is going on for them, what you have to do to adapt to the culture, what you have to do to adapt to the individual and their given circumstances. A uh, very small example in the uh, uh premium trial that I mentioned earlier that Vikram Patel ran in uh, in India, where they were comparing this uh, uh, brief uh, uh, culturally adapted ver uh, intervention delivered by lay counselors. Uh, one of the other things they picked up is, is typically the case about two thirds of the people that they identified as being depressed were women, uh, about uh, one third men. And uh, I suspect that's because the women usually end up living with men that they end up getting depressed. But uh, uh, that said, about uh, a quarter of them were being abused by their husbands. In the relationships, and uh, over the course of the six to eight sessions, that got cut in half in the uh, HAP condition. And we didn't necessarily go after uh, uh, doing things to help reduce uh, incidents of violence, but the uh, women that were going through that process were able to pick up and use whatever they were getting in the intervention to cut something down, uh, to, to reduce something they would have considered a problematic for them. So you 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 stumble over things that you didn't anticipate and want to see if we can figure out what was going on there. But that's going to be uh, it looks like it's helpful in rural India. It looks like it's going to be helpful in uh, in rural Texas. And it looks like it's going to be helpful uh, in uh, in uh, uh, the UK as well. Yes, 100%. And Joseph is asking a question um, sort of relating to this in the chat. And um, he's asking, how is this all going to change in coming generations? And he's saying how yesterday's keynote highlighted that now uh, mental health and the language around it are becoming so global. So even if people, especially adults, resist Western perspectives, 
medicine and neurobiology, young people don't seem so concerned or actively and are or are actively embracing Western notions to destigmatize. Um, so I think that's a great follow-up question. And again, please feel free to jump in. I'm not going to call in a specific order. I think it's easier to jump in. But so the change of this in coming generations, maybe I guess, yeah, if you have any insights, because I think you're really at the forefront of sort of leading efforts in the young generation and sort of reclaiming what is on the mental health. So maybe... Yeah, I think media and the internet plays a big role in this because, uh, yeah, uh, also we've been hearing, like for me at least, I've been hearing a lot of medicalized narratives of mental illness and, um, you know, like I remember hearing terms like serotonin and um, clinical depression and stuff like that in uh, like media that's just meant for us young people. And that's where I think uh, uh, young people like me started getting more interested into the neurobiology aspect and started looking at mental health from a very biomedical lens. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's also, like, oh, yeah, sorry, really sorry to interrupt, but also I think there's a lack of awareness around this critical perspective or uh, like I didn't know about this entire critical perspective until I met um, Joseph so yeah yeah, yeah. I, I wonder about your experience of sort of trying to navigate these spaces because I, I know you talked about liking to use the term a student researcher in order to sort of give you a bit of legitimacy so I'm, I'm wondering how you navigate sort of the interest and desire to put more push forward for more critical perspectives and sort of your legitimacy as a young sort of advocate. Um, I mean, yeah. Um, so I think, uh, I don't know how to answer this question. Uh, can you repeat it actually? That'd be great. Yeah. Or so, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just rephrase it because um, so you're talking about sort of yeah. the, the, the dominance of the biomedical approaches, right? And how um, you're finding it hard to sort of find a critical perspective. Yes. But that you are really interested in that, right? So I'm, I'm wondering what are you, what are your experiences of trying to put in a for, trying to put forward a more critical perspective around mental health and sort of change and disrupt ideas yeah. while at the same time being and maybe sort of trying Got to it. get taken seriously yeah so of course so when i have this conversation with even like young people like me it's very uh very difficult to get them to believe me i think uh, especially because i don't have a phd or even a bachelor's degree uh, as a matter of fact and even when i'm on a kind of uh, show them some evidence around and even um, there are not many articles that I can forward and kind of, you know, be like, okay, this is a very simplified explanation. That's why I actually I also started the blog. Uh, so I can kind of make a uh, debunk uh, stuff like the chemical imbalance theory and the whole critical perspective around it into a more simplified language and uh, share it across pe with people. Um, yeah. So I think because uh, most of the literature that even I was exposed to was kind of really scientific and it took me a lot of time also to understand it um yeah thank you um uh, go ahead i'm just gonna throw something in if i can unless sumet did you want to go first yeah no no you go ahead uh steve okay, i'll just say I, th I think the notion of including people that have lived experience uh, in the process, the research, et cetera, is absolutely marvelous. And I have uh, first saw that in the UK, and I thought it was a, a great idea. Uh, you don't, just being a, uh, quote, uh, a scientist or a trained professional doesn't mean you don't have your lived experience. I've had a couple of episodes of depression, uh, talk about that openly uh, back in my early uh, 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 20s, and uh, it's a nasty experience. On the other hand, uh, I made, uh, in those three successive years, I made major life decisions uh, that, 30, 40 years, uh, 30 years later, my uh, uh, evolution biologist uh, uh, colleague, Paul Andrews, would suggest was exactly what depression evolved to do. It's, it gets you thinking critically about 
major issues in your life that you have to change. It was an unpleasant experience for me each time after uh, one after the other. But I got, uh, I, I, in retrospect, I'm glad that I ended up making the decisions I made. And would I have gotten there if I weren't thinking that carefully and hard in the midst of the of the distress about that kind of thing? I'm not sure. Robert Whitaker did an absolutely amazing uh, book about uh, 15 years ago now, Anatomy of an Epidemic, I think is uh, 2010. And he goes through the various, uh, psych, quote, psychological disorders and points out that the uh, assumption of, uh, of a uh, medical model, as useful as it is in some respects, uh, oftentimes goes way too far. And he can point to instances where uh, things like the psychoses, uh, we, uh, I was trained in a way that assumed that they ought to be treated. Well, you think people have a right to decide whether they want to be treated or not. And there are some uh, indications on the fringes that if you don't immediately medicate somebody in their first episode of psychosis, help them ride through it, their uh, uh, supportive communities in, in Finland, among other places that will do that, uh, the long-term outcomes are better than if you start out jumping right in the midst of a, of a biological medical model. And not to knock medications, if I get a headache, I take an aspirin. Uh, all that being said, um, pain serves a useful function. And uh, if you're an NFL football player and you uh, take painkillers to get you back on the field the next uh, week, uh, 20 years down the line, you're not gonna be able to walk. So there's some things that we can do to uh, uh, override distress at the moment that aren't necessarily in our long-term benefit. And uh, I think anything, any, looking at those possibilities and the long-term consequences is something that just is a smart thing to do. Question everything. Yeah, um, it's just, yeah, I guess I just want to come in on, on Joseph's question to say that, um, and Joseph's asking sort of why, I mean, where, how is this all going to change in coming generations? And, and, and I think, you know, Steve and Joseph were bo both referencing sort of the fact that that there's a sort of global flow of knowledge in, in various directions that takes place. And I guess for me, in terms of, and, and I think that's, and I think um, there's something about also about um, global processes and globalization that actually will play into this in terms of where how things are going to change in coming generations. Because if I think about the people I did field work with in North India in sort of 2004 to 2008 in that period, uh, you, you know, f yeah, young people, um, farmer, people who are farmers, agricultural area, things have changed in the last 10 years, even just things have changed so rapidly in terms of access to knowledge, access to internet, access to um, markets, and, the, and, and these things are shifting, and also the nature of climate change is a major issue um, globally. So so in some ways, I, I think how there might be a convergence in terms of how people might be thinking about these things. But again, it, I think the point that one of you made earlier about how everything is local and the local dynamics are really, really important, it'll play out differently in different places. Um, um, I, I'm not necessarily sure that people are, are will will completely in 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 non-Western context embrace fully embrace Western ideas because I think actually also untangling what those things are is actually also becoming much harder now to say this is you know how people's it's also partly about how people's identities are also shifting as well and 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 how you see who you are because our identities are also becoming in some ways in some ways quite inter. Um, Un, uh, quite tangled up in terms of who we are, no matter where where we are in much of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That was really interesting, and I, I think maybe um, to continue this, when we're thinking about change and like sort of how everything is sort of evolving together and. I'm wondering what does that mean for global health in terms of its goals? And do we have a set of sort of goals we agree on and that we value that we can sort of look forward to when we're sort of navigating change and sort of striving for change, right? So I'm just getting back to like, what is global health for and for whom, right? And when we're thinking about goals, I don't know, maybe, Steve, do you want to go first? I'm sorry, no, I said. I said, Steve, do you want to? Yeah, yeah, again, as somebody who uh, doesn't think of himself as particularly knowledgeable about global health, 
uh, et cetera. Uh, almost as an outsider looking in, I think the whole process is uh, very interesting, very exciting. And as Sumet was just saying, uh, there's a rapid period of change going on. I think things are going to have to sort themselves out. On the other hand, there's certain things that come close to universals. I think of my colleague, Daisy Singler, who's been doing work with antenatal depression on the, at least three different continents now in the multiple different countries. And uh, people are going to have babies. They want to have healthy babies. They want to be able to uh, raise them, et cetera. And they're, they're just issues that they're going to run into. They're going to be different as a function of uh, uh, culture, different as a function of uh, uh, setting, different as a function of access to resources. But... Um, Gee, the uh, my, I may I was my son was born cesarean. I was born cesarean. Uh, it's not necessarily clear that it's always to the advantage of the mom or the child or the uh, uh, father uh, to have cesarean births. We probably rely too heavily in this country, and there are uh, there there are things that uh, Western technology could stand to learn from people that have been delivering babies for for years and uh, for centuries, and uh, to pick up another context. Sometimes we overly over medicalize uh, processes. Yes, Augusta, are you happy to go next? I mean, I, I really don't have any right now, but uh, I mean, I'm just thinking that uh, the more and more we get to know, and I think I think our goals are going to change, uh, even global health, global mental health. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question, could you just just rephrase the question again yeah sorry yeah um sure i'm when I, I i guess when we're thinking about global mental health what are we striving for or what is our set of goals that we're trying to achieve and especially thinking that the world is changing so much right mm -hmm. our, our goals changing too are they not and how do we characterize positive change Mm, yeah, I I guess I it got what you yeah it's got me thinking also back again to thinking about rights and rights based perspectives and um and and the right the right to health um and the and the right um the right for example you know in terms of mental health in terms of the some of the rights around around um not being non coercive care and um um and maybe maybe those are things we can fall back on in terms of um you know what might be agreeable i mean the, the problem with agreeable goals is that there are various people sitting around the table and and also um yeah so that's one thing and and they may have there be also different power interests different power levels within that in terms of who can dictate agendas and and, and push for particular agendas and i think but whereas i think um something around rights is as 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 an agreeable set, not not necessarily goals, but a framework, might be a way for different sorts of things to happen. Because I think one of the challenges we think we things we want to avoid is is um, developing a sort of a more of a monoculture of of what is global mental health, and we want to keep this as a as a pluralistic um, discipline and way of thinking. So that plur plural um, pluralistic um, ways of addressing mental health are available to people, but a rights-based approach might allow us to think about those pluralistic approaches and ensure that they're they're sort of meeting a minimum standard and 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 respecting people's um you know basic human rights and that that may be one way of of thinking about this in terms of agreeable goals the second thing is is i guess in terms of um thinking about this in terms of inequalities and and um and and and, and things that might be shaping Poor mental health, you know, in terms of social determinants and structural determinants, and then maybe, maybe there may be some agreeable things around, for example, poverty or gender inequality or other other aspects that might be agreeable development goals in terms of, sort of the development wider international development sort of um, frame of thinking that might that that might fit into this and the and the 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 um, and this that may be another way of thinking about this in terms of what might be common areas. I have a question for you just to follow up on that because it's something that I think about often when taking pluralistic, um, having pluralistic views and um, ways of seeing. What I find sometimes hard is how do we acknowledge that we're all different 
and how and accommodate those pluralistic types of views whilst also not falling into patterns that can be othering or exoticizing of others and others' cultures. Because I, I think that's where I find a problem with global mental health. Either it's not contextualized enough mm. or sometimes it goes into an extreme that's also not productive or helpful, I think. Yeah. yeah. You mean an extreme in terms of cultural... Um, um, specific specificity is that what you meant by the extreme yeah in terms of the extreme of like acknowledging almost cultural differences too much to the point that it becomes othering or we're exoticizing someone's culture and sort of you know which i think can quickly become very problematic so i'm, I'm wondering i don't know if you have any thoughts about navigating the sort of allowing plur plurality without doing it injustice yeah. Yeah, yeah what's it saying any any good idea taken to an extreme becomes a bad idea i think the uh, similar saying originally the notion of uh, uh, uh emphasizing the, the right of the individual and uh, above all else the, to accept not accept do whatever they want to do the second thing and i we had Vikram in town last week, uh, Patel in town uh, for a thought and psychopathology training seminar. And he was giving, talking about his background. He described how as a uh, young physician in uh, in uh, Africa, South Africa, he was struck by the fact that uh, that was early in the AIDS, early middle of AIDS ac epidemic and how what had become a uh, survivable, uh, manageable disorder in uh, other parts of the world, people were still dying in great numbers because they said, simply didn't have access to the kinds of uh, medications that would enable them to uh, uh, to survive the disorder. So I think the, uh, the first principle is that the, the rights of the individual first and foremost. And the second principle is just access. If there's something that does work someplace, somewhere, people ought to have the right to have access to that. And they can make their own decisions whether they want to take advantage of it or not, but or use something else. But uh, the, the, the lack of access is just a huge uh, uh, problem in, uh, that uh, around the world, but uh, within virtually any country that I know as well. Yeah. Great. Thank you. That was really helpful. Um, I'm looking just at the chat right now because we're getting some questions in and I just want to address those. Um, so Joseph is asking, how do existing infrastructures, for example, higher education or the internet, make knowledge transfer slash product slash knowledge production better or worse? or impossible? Are there open opportunities for change? Um, and he also then says, also curious about thoughts on Global South or even India yeah. as a monolithic entity, for yeah. example, this, way, this therapy works in the Global South, etc. Mm. It feels sort of impossible. Yeah. Um, can I come in on the infrastructure point? Because um, I was just that immediately reminded me that many of the NGO partners we work with in India during the COVID period rapidly adapted mm -hmm. to some of them had already been doing sort of you know, te you know, telemental health, so to speak, but but rapidly adapted their, you know, these organizations mainly with grassroots workers working in, in sort of marginalized areas. And they rapidly and adapted, and similarly the organization I work with in Nepal as well, uh, rapidly adapted to sort of using the internet, using these platforms to not only provide care. Uh, but also to share knowledge within their organizations. And we're, we're currently working on a, on a project to try and develop with a, um, with the Mariwala Health Initiative in India to develop a um, knowledge exchange platform for grassroots mental health NGOs and their workers to share knowledge between within between organizations. And, and I think one of the, as part of the the consultation around that and 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 we're doing focus groups with community workers in different parts of the country to try and get their views on what a platform might look like. What we've actually been learning is actually a lot they've been doing a lot of that work of using the internet and using using mm. platforms to share knowledge within organizations already and that's been a really important way in terms of but but, but the inter-organization knowledge transfer has been less mm. less um prominent partly because these are very local based organizations who are working in very particular areas and folk and also the burden of their work the work they do is really you know, it's, it's labor and it's it's quite intense work, and and it's dealing with very difficult issues. Um, just on on, if I can add on the global south point, and and I, I agree completely with what Joseph is sort of suggesting in his question that we can't think about global south, or 
or India or or South Asia as as monolithic entities. And I think this comes back to the one of the points raised earlier about things being local and thinking about these in, in very local terms. I mean, within India and a, across various states, it's so different. As someone sort of suggested at the very beginning, that it, it's 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 such different types of health systems and structures of health systems and resource source resources and health systems that 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 alone plus many other things make 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 these solutions make makes it important that we think about these solutions in very local terms and um, working with local social entrepreneurs yeah i agree i think i always bang on the point of needing to contextualize things which sounds like such a simple point but I, I think a lot of people think about contextualization, like adding a paragraph in your background section or something like that. Whereas like contextualizing, I think to me requires thinking about even your methodology, your methods and how you approach them, right? To incorporate for the local and how you see that. And I, I think this is why um, I appreciate your work, for example, in using methods like ethnography or qualitative methods to sort of be able to like understand the local and account for it. Um, but um, the chat is continuing to go on. So I'm just going to, we have four minutes left. I'm just going to quickly see if there is another question. Oh no, these are just comments about people connecting. Um, but yeah, maybe um, Steve and Agastya, if any of you want to speak again to like the question of uh, infrastructures or um, the question of sort of monolithic entities and how we sort of go about when thinking about mental health. Hmm. Agastya, you want to go first? No, no, you can go. I'll just say I've been doing an undergraduate course to teach at Vanderbilt, uh, and the focus of the course is everything I was wrong about 10 years ago. So the notion that uh, uh, any of us have a, a, a um, and I've been at this for close to 50 years, the notion that any of us have a really great sense as to exactly what's going on is just wrong. And uh, disagreement is what leads to discovery. And it's those little anomalies that uh, the little things that kind of niggle at the corner that didn't quite fit the existing theory that forced then the whole cell change in theory down the line. Uh, I think the, the more universal, the more global, the more the broader, the more inclusive, uh, the approach to things are the better we are, the more likely we are to come up with things that are going to be end up being useful to uh, individuals and, and to the species. I say one thing: human beings, by and large, are not great at anticipating what they need to do. They're great at capitalizing on what worked once they stumble over it. And uh, uh, if nothing else, uh, we we learn from our mistakes, but we and we we can move things along in the in, the, uh, in a better direction, but uh, hopefully an upward spiral. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I'm looking at the time and I think we have two minutes left. So maybe if we want to round up and if anyone just has any closing remarks, we can probably go in order. Um, but yeah, any closing remarks, hopes for the future, uh, what you're hopeful about, what you're excited about or any closing thoughts? Mm -hmm. I guess, said do you want to go first? I mean, I'm hopeful that I think in the coming future, uh, a lot of young people are going to be, like me, uh, are going to be involved in the field of global mental health and actually now look at it uh, from a more critical lens also, but uh, also seeing how that can be using the critical perspectives, how we can improve the practice of global mental health. Um, and I think with these latest technologies, uh, so what Sumit said with the smartphone, uh, I think until now there was a problem that everyone in India did not have a smartphone uh, and mm -hmm. in rural areas, but now that has started to get better. Uh, a lot of people have started to get smartphones and now that opens up a way, a variety of uh, different um, interventions that can be delivered uh, through these smartphones and how knowledge can now be shared um, through that. So I, I'm I'm hopeful to see a lot of I think research around that and uh, I think there is a lot of research being conducted on how on teletherapy at the moment I think even the government has right now started an initiative in India on 
mental health and I think tele therapy. Um, I think, yeah. So I'm hopeful to see how that goes, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is Steve. Uh, technology is always a double-edged sword, but you hope you can harness it. Uh, if you can teach somebody to become anorectic over the internet with a, with a smartphone, you'd hope you could help somebody learn how not to be or have double eating disorder or anything else in the same kind of fashion. And my, uh, what I think I've seen in the data is that we've come leaps and bounds with uh, uh, remote uh, digital interventions, et cetera. We are now able to do things we couldn't do 10 years ago that approach the same level of outcome, outcomes that you got with face-to-face -face therapies. And that makes things just a whole lot more accessible and it's a lot more democratic, a lot more universal. Yeah, thanks. I think what's exciting me and just giving me some hope is that there are lots of people working and I think Augusta, you mentioned young people working on the ground, um, trying to change not just around mental health, but around sort of adjacent wider issues in terms of activism, in terms of, um, you know, um, NGO work and, and and social change work, and I think that's that's quite that's really, and also trying to make those connections and make those intersectional and and um, intersectional connections between um, different different sort, sort sets of issues to think about how things interrelate, which is really be I guess one of the key ways in which we can go about addressing some of these challenges. So that that does give me quite mm -hmm. quite a bit of hope. And I guess we just have to remain hopeful. We have no choice but to remain hopeful in terms of how things are going to go. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise, and that, that's a, at every level of our life, I guess. Otherwise, mm -hmm. um, it'll, it's very hard to carry on. <laughs> There's always hope. Yeah. I agree. I think that was the perfect note to end on. Um, we're just at time. I don't know if, Joseph, if you want to close it off or...